I'm good. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Linux for the Rest of Us, episode 194. This is a show about all things Linux, whether it's hardware, software, whatever tickles our Linux fancy. I am Cody Cooper, a.k.a. SuperCoop, and I am happy to be back with my good friend, the Linux Maven, the door-to-door geek, a.k.a. Stephen McLaughlin, who's shaking his head. How's it going, door? Just like that. Just like that. It's like we were never gone. And that's why Cody is much more professional than me. Consummate professional. Consummate. consummate. Dude. You're going to have to get used to it. It is so good to sit and chat with you. Ditto. A, A, I'm happy you're live. Mm -hmm. Because there's little doubt the stress you, I don't want to say endured, the stress you thrived in, I'm guessing, was much, was great. And you came out the other side and you're still breathing. It's great. Every year, the holiday season is pretty rough. This year, I, I seriously feel like I ate too much fish before I went into hibernation. Mm-hmm. And then I woke up way too late. It was just crazy. But um, yeah, I'm just I'm just happy you're back. It's great to hear your voice, too, even though I still talk to you just about every day. It's great to be back. Um, a variety of you know things have happened since, what, October? October. October. Jeez. Of, of last year. It's now a well, whole new year. Yes. But I mean, see, I, I'm like Steve C and back in the day, Steve C never said something because he knew people would hold him to it. So I'm saying this very, um, deliberately next year. When Cody gets busy, I'm still going to release something. It's not going to be the show of the same caliber, but it, at least there will be a heartbeat in the feed to let people know something's still going on because literally I got a couple of pings in the last couple of weeks. Are you guys still doing the show? Are you still alive? Did you pod fade? Because it was, I didn't realize from October we haven't. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. And I've, I've gotten some messages too. Um, I should have had, okay. Yeah. (laughs) I got to give a shout out to uh, Scott Schuster here. Very, very short email. Uh, the header of which was, I hope you were okay. And in the in the actual message, it says, miss your Linux fancy. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so, Scott, if you're hearing this, if you haven't deleted your feed, or our feed from your catcher, uh, it, it, was, it was your inspirational message. All uh, 18 letters of it. It could have been a tweet. Caused me to come back. Yeah, so it, short. it literally could have been a tweet. Um, I will say I've switched my email client a couple times and I've had more than a couple emails. I don't know how, but I completely missed them. And you said, Scott, and you mentioned an email and I'm sitting there mm-hmm. thinking, I didn't see that email. So I type in my email, Scott, and I see it was delivered to us, uh, the 22nd and I just now noticed it. So, oh, wow. Yeah. It was just uh, a few days ago. Yeah. So. I would be rude and have you hear the clicks of my keyboard as I reply to you, Scott, but you know, that would be rude. That's my excuse. But we're back. Okay. We're back in the saddle again. I'm terrified of horses, but yes. (laughs) Me too. But the, the, the day I became terrified of horses, I became more terrified of chickens. I was, it was a, uh, elementary school visit to a farm. The horses were large and scary and they, you know, kicked and whatever, but I actually got pecked by a chicken. So in mm. my mind, that was the more, you know, dangerous animal. Well, they're definitely more hyper, I'll say. Yep. Okay. Well, a lot of announcements to start this because again, it's been so while. The first is the website is more polished. The website is never finished. It's a continuous work in progress. But if you go to podnos.com, you will see. The new website, I've tried to add more things. In the last week, I literally just added uh, podnets.com slash deals uh, and a couple of things like that. I implore people, go to the website. If there's something you do not see that you expect on that website or something you would like on that website, you have to let me know. Um, the more people that complain about something, the more likely it will get done in a timely manner, if you know what I mean. Yeah, no, the new site looks great. For those of you who haven't been to it in a while, just check it out. Just still podnuts.com. 
uh which uh it's it's still running off uh, wordpress right it is now yes before back in the day it oh, was drupal that's right and it was quite painful yeah but yeah everything i mean all the little the little things i noticed as far as being you know out of place or this needs to be moved or whatever over the first you know month they're all fixed now yeah no it looks great and in addition to that we also have some um, not only the the visual revamping of the our web presence but we also have a couple new shows on the network isn't that correct uh we have we had one depart so far and i'm honestly thinking i don't know where we 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 might have one or two officially retire too but um yes we have two brand new ones uh call that girl lisa show if you just search for her you'll find her on podbean um it's the same feed url so if you ever subscribed to her show you're still subscribed to her show, but now she's not on Podnuts. I helped her in every way I could to make it as painless a process for her and the listeners. Uh, and then we have two new shows, one of which is hosted by, I personally think of as two of the best guys, period. Uh, and I'm pretty sure both friends of yours, oh, yeah. Jonathan and Tracy Holtz doing uh, uh, Book Nuts. And which Jonathan is this that we know of? Um, I'm pretty sure it's Jonathan the Admiral Nidhi. <laughs> NATO. Jonathan NATO. Yeah, like Play Doh. Uh, yeah, that's one way of doing it. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah. They both are almost hardcore audiobook people. Jonathan listens to everything literally like 16x. So when he has a 40 hour book series, he can listen to it in like an afternoon. Um, yeah. So he consumes a great mass quantities of audiobooks. And Tracy uh, quit his nine to five like a decade ago, started up a computer repair business like a year ago or so, quit that. Now he's doing aquaponics and farm living. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's just say he has more time to where he, if he wants to, he can stick in a headphone and listen. So he's found audiobooks, and those two are just uh, talking about uh, reviewing independent audiobooks each episode. So if you find yourself liking uh, audiobooks, I cannot encourage you more. Check that show out. The hosts are fantastic, but I'm sure the content is also uh, equally as good. Me not really knowing audiobooks, I listen to it, and I just like hearing them talk. So, you know. I've listened to a handful of, of them over the years, audiobooks, I mean. Uh, with, but with as much as I commute now, I think that I should start listening to him again. In fact, I just started re-listening for probably the sixth or seventh time. Uh, Kevin Mitnick's Ghost in the Wires. Uh, that was his third book, more of his uh, autobiography, which is a fantastic audiobook. I'm I hope they have that one in the pipeline because I actually uh, got turned on to that book by Tracy uh, like three or four years ago. So yeah, can't wait to delve into that. And it, it, think of it as like a you know a, a geeky book club. Is, is is how it was explained to me and after listening to the pilot episode I, I i can agree so definitely looking forward to delving into that one but i must say that the, the other show that has started definitely piques my interest probably just one percent more it's like a 51 49 split yeah that that's one that i teased for man eight months or so that i wanted to do a mini pc show and it's finally quote unquote off the ground um Right now on the show is myself, Eric R. R. Dini from Android App Addicts and Geeksters and other shows like that. And then we have a new guy, and I keep forgetting what he wants to be known as, so it's Brian. Uh, ask the cable guy, Brian. All of us have some level of passion for many computers and different levels of, I'll say, expertise. Brian is a network engineer, um, uh, kind of guy he's the guy who if you ask to explain level three networking can probably do it um me i'm just the guy who's really fascinated with small computers love linux love mimicking of hacking because i don't really hack and then eric is an extreme fanatic about tech toys and gadgets so mm -hmm. the three of us sit down and we basically just talk the breeze about all kinds of mini computers Sometimes it's our experiences. Sometimes it's new ones that we discovered. Um, but the beautiful thing about that show is it is like what Android App Addicts started 400 episodes ago. When we first started it, we first said to ourselves, I don't know if we're going to have enough content. 
this literally let me be like a three month show because then there's nothing to talk about. Um, there's little doubt in my mind. This is a ever growing niche. That's only going to be more and more mainstream as time goes on. It's literally probably 50 to 60% of my social media feeds now. Just uh, updates to older versions, newer hardwares, new manufacturer. You know, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's a huge, huge market right now. And yeah, it's, it's yeah. only going to get bigger and better. Yeah. And I will say uh, very abruptly and very firmly, it is not an Internet of Things show. Mm -mm. It is more closer to being a intelligent Internet of Things show where we expect these devices to be far smarter than a hue light bulb. We expect in the future to have multiple small computer computing a, um, a, a, a appliances, whether it be a kitchen computer, whether it be a, like a bulletin board for the front door. Or, or whether it be the main hub controller for the Internet of Things or a home theater PC or whatever, they're all quote-unquote mini computers. To me, Internet of Things is far too boring and far too insecure of an arena to di discuss. I could not agree more. All right, well, let's get right into it, considering we have, we have quite the backlog. We're going to go ahead and actually just talk about everything that's happened since October. Starting now. now. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, we're really not. Okay, so tell me about this clear Linux project, or okay. Well, first, again, as always, a reminder: Think Penguin coupons are available. If you find yourself interested in wanting to support a company that supports free software, let me know. I'll give you a give you a coupon to save some money over on a company that actually values your freedom and your privacy, and that's ThinkPenguin.com. And with tax time coming up, it might be the right time to purchase either that laptop desktop or that small form factor PC if you really need it within your home. So, yeah, exactly. And absolutely. Um, the first link I put in here, honestly, Cody, because I was slightly confused and interested. And with that, I'll say if you go to um, twitter.com slash pod nuts or you go to youtube.com slash Twitter door geek. When I'm done doing these shows now, I'm uploading a higher quality video of these shows. So if you want to see the pages we're talking about, see the links we're talking about, uh, go ahead and check that out and let me know what you think about it. Um, there's going to be two videos for each show, the live feed and then the uploaded after the words. The live feed is going to be less quality, less video quality because it's streaming live. Okay. This first link is called Clear Linux. First off, Great name. Can't believe anyone has not used this before because it gives the impression of something that's transparent. And in my opinion, something that is more simple. It's clear. You know what I mean? It's clear. It's clear. Clear Linux is an Intel initiative. Okay. This is again another huge major company deciding we have to put resources directly into the Linux kernel and into. Linux to ensure we have the highest level of support from this operating system because you can. They can't do this with Microsoft. They can't do this with Apple. They can't do this with anybody else because they would literally have to buy part of the company out from, out from under them. Um, Clear Linux offers Docker like containers that supposedly work a little bit better with uh, Intel processors and the, and the um, Linux operating system. Um, I just think this is good to see big people supporting these kinds of things. Um, I doubt I'm ever going to use it. I doubt I'm ever going to need it. I doubt I'm ever going to run it, but I do think it's pretty cool that they're doing it. And yeah, that, that's not to say that one of our listeners can't benefit from it. So, yeah, I, I had no idea about any of this, but reading, you know, the couple little blurbs here, I'm still trying to kind of wrap my head around it. But having them release something like this that's going to be optimized for their own hardware just makes, a, you know, good business sense. But to have, potentially have that, you know, rolled up and available for everybody else, too, is pretty cool. Yeah, and without sounding stupid, Intel was it. The Intel x86 architecture 
was everything. Okay. You had like Sony PS2 with the, um, uh, what was that, um, processor? The PS3. It was the, um, yeah. the, the power, the old power PC processor, the same thing the old Macs used to run. Right. They're gone. They're dead. Basically. They don't exist yeah. anymore. Um, and except for that everywhere in the world, you basically had X86 processor the, and then you had cheap low end processors that really didn't do a whole lot. ARM is becoming major. There's now many devices shipping with ARM. You're going to start seeing Linux laptops being developed and shipped with ARM processors. Um, there's ARM servers out there. So Intel is trying everything in its power to keep the, to keep their model of processing as relevant as possible. That, 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 there's a nonstop game for them. So this is, I think what this is, is just trying to be as long as possible, as long as possible. And, you know, good luck to them, but you know, whatever is better will win it, win in the end. Well, I, I I'm not going to get an argument or a debate here with you, but uh, you, you made some good points there, but I think there's definitely room for both and for even more because competition is just, you know, uh, make a better product all around for everybody. But having ARM, especially with the um, the cost effectiveness of not only production, but yeah. and the cost to the user, yeah, you're going to see that in n not only, you know, developing countries, but, you know, mass uh, purchases for large institutions, you know, such as schools. I mean, once you, I mean, right, you already talked about, you know, Chromebooks being rolled out. But once you start seeing um, other potential uh, ARM, maybe sub one hundred dollar laptops, you know, running Linux, yeah, you're going to see that whole uh, sector just take off. Yeah, and there's always going to be room for both. Well, one of the things I think I don't want to say, I don't want to sound, you know, whatever. One of the things I think I figured out in the last year is technology never dies. It's just a question of what percentage of everything is it getting and my example is like um cds and vinyl disc they're not completely gone they still have a use case they're still around it's just they're not the majority they're not the main selling point they're not the eye catching they're not where the money's flowing right now but they still exist so right. no matter what we're always going to have i think multiple architectures it's just a question of what percentage is each getting in the market Right. But also as the market grows, even if they have, I mean, if, if, if you're not talking about market share, I mean, Linux is a perfect example. If you want, you want to talk about, you know, uh, you know, the general, you know, a uh, home user market share, it's very low. You want to talk about enterprise, you know, it's, it's definitely growing. It's growing the home, the home user too. But as, as the overall market grows, more people getting into computers, more countries having uh, bigger programs. Yeah, it's it's still it's still a viable business, but I think that you made a good point too, that especially when you're talking about your your, uh, your example with media, there's there's a certain point where when we talk about storage media, yeah, this is still around, but th there's there's that fear factor of when do I need to move my crucial files off of this and right. back it up? Because I was reading a great article just yesterday about uh, the old magnetic tapes. I was at my local recycle center, which is in uh, Eugene, Oregon, right by the University of Oregon. So they get donated, you know, all this. I mean, it's a, it's a computer uh, reuse recycle center. They they uh, do community community outreach. Uh, it's called Next Step Computing. They did community outreach. They you know make donations. They take donations. They rebuild computers. They do. A, they have a retail store, but they had this huge rack of nothing but just ancient uh, uh, media, and it's all sealed, you know, brand new packaging. I'm talking like I bought a a five pack of Fuji film five oh. quarter floppies for a oh. dollar, right? Just just to have it in my office, right? And, you know, zip disks, jazz disks, you yeah. know, uh, old mag tape. I mean, so many different. You know, it was it was just like looking at a little little bookshelf of history, and I thought, well, what's you know? And I started doing some research, and yeah, that that they're uh, right now for, for the magnetic tapes, people are. Uh, saying it's, it's time to move off of that because of you know the the overall you know um, lifespan of that but when you get into you know optical discs there's disc rot over time for instance you know some laser discs back in the day possibly also because it was an early early disc technology and because they're so large you know they're starting to rot out where they won't even play anymore 
So you're talking about optical media over the next, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. It's going to be definitely dead. Yeah. The only thing that has lasted is stone tablets. Can't hack into my mole skin. Tell you that. Well, yeah, okay. Um, okay. Okay. Neck link here. To me, this was an indicator. This was a flag. You know how in my work, in my projects, I like to have a flag set way off in the distance. And then as a team, we do our best to go towards that flag, AKA uh, indicators. You know what I mean? Um, this was an indicator I saw um, from CES this year, which is over now, like about two weeks or maybe three weeks. Mm -hmm. And it was um, on uh, Linux.com, Linux based drone upstage other mobile gadgets at CES. And here's how I think I know Linux is just doing better and better and better and better. Most of these drones that I saw, they did not focus on the fact this is running Linux. They just said, here's a cool drone. Look what this drone can do. There's the drone that can automatically follow you. You put on a little bracelet. There's the drone that can automatically avoid obstacles. Uh, there's all kinds of different ones that they showcased. Um, some of them were really cool looking um but i will say in general a lot of the things that i saw i looked at and said to myself is this running a full-fledged operating system and is it running linux and a huge percentage of it i thought was probable or absolutely it has to be running something like linux some um, everything from drones uh, and uh, samsung tizen watches Mm -hmm. uh, and, be, and quadcopters and all kinds of things. So, um, Linux is ever expanding and how much it's just going to slowly and consistently take over consumer electronics. And of course the desktop will not ever happen probably, but you know, ah, uh, well, whatever. I, know. I, 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 I hate I, I hate how that's a, a measure. Well, you know, when is the year of the next desktop? Well, yeah. Don't, it, don't hold your breath. Just enjoy the ride. It's like asking, oh, so when are we going to get to the edge of the, the universe? We have billions of different things to do between now and then. Let's not focus on one of the big crazy things. Um, it's like, when are we going to live forever? Well, how about for now, we just have self-driving cars, so we stop killing each other. You know, yeah. take those, I don't want to say baby steps, but babier steps. Uh, but yeah, I thought this was a good article with a, God, with, uh, with a lot of links to a lot of very cool things. And yes, there was a lot of car tech too. And every single one of them, I guarantee you, is either running a Unix-based, BSD-based, or Linux-based OS because, you know, that's what they do. Because it's cost-effective. Very, very cost effective. Very cost effective. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I've been slightly enamored uh, because of the mini PC stuff to look at ways to do some monitoring, if you will. It's easy to set up a box in the corner of your house and to do QoS and say, well, I'm going to turn down the speed on my kid's tablet. I'm going to turn down the speed on my wife's Netflix or whatever you do. Mm -hmm. But monitoring is the other part of that and i found this um glances over at text uh tech mint t-e-c-m-i-n-t um and i i really liked the features and the look of this because it was extremely low resources to have a monitoring tool taking up lots of resources is counterproductive it's like performing surgery with infected tools Aren't you trying to save the person? What the hell is wrong with you? Right, so right, this right. was an extremely light one. And if you use these kind of tools preemptively, you might find out you don't need the QS as much as you need to. You just need to better manage the, the devices on your network and make sure they go into sleep mode when they should, or maybe they shouldn't check for updates every 45 seconds. Maybe once every 45 days is fine. But um, the end... Sorry, this may sound like a silly question, but can mm -hmm. this also can this measure power consumption? Um, it will on the local device itself, yes. Okay. It 
Yeah, because I'm I'm looking at go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I, I'll say it should be because it does have uh, CPU and load type stats. So I will say it should be able to at least locally. Um, and th- th- to be honest, the other thing I liked about this is it re- it basically reminded me a lot of Top. So as soon as I looked at the screen, some of it immediately made sense. And looking at this screen, I know where I've seen this now after I'm sitting down talking to you. This came pre-installed by default on my Voyager Linux laptop. Oh, very nice. So now it makes sense because I do remember seeing mount, disk IO, network, CPU, load, mem, swap processors all in one screen. So that's how so that's what they were doing. Um I like this a lot. Uh, now, granted, it, if you want to monitor your entire "quote unquote" network, you're going to need this running on every device. But if you have it running on your big devices, which I can because that's what I have on my house—nothing but Linux—I can I can definitely get some more comprehension to what's going on. Yeah, I'm going to look into this because I'm looking to set up a few other computers here in my office that I'm finally well still revamping but it's it's near a complete quote-unquote state and i don't know if it's going to be more cost effective for me to maybe get some uh mini pcs um for certain tasks or to run it off of uh, some older laptops so yeah uh definitely looking forward to checking this out gotcha gotcha okay this next one i'm going to do my best not to rant cody that's what this really is this is a stinking rant here we go. Um, Buckling in. I really don't comprehend some people in the Linux community. And I know I'm not that smart. I know I'm not that smart. My wife tells me all the time. But there's easy ways to do things, and there's hard ways to do things. And I'm not going to say that people, other people do it wrong. But I will say... If you do it the hard way, don't complain about how you do it. And then if you use KDE and then you don't understand audio configurations when you go on another computer, don't complain. Okay. KDE wants to control everything in the verse completely. So once you get out of the KDE thing, it's literally like going from Linux to Windows. It is. I like using more generic tools and me and cody even affirmed this over the last two weeks or so that this tool is the tool to use whenever you need to do whatever you need to utterly control your audio in linux without pain without struggle without text file configurations without master's degrees without real-time kernels and without knowing an explicit desktop Okay. Uh, Pulse audio is not great, but when you have the tools like PAVU control, PAVU control is the tool that I use when I need to change my audio. Um, Awesome Mixer was the old one to do it. Now, Awesome Mixer is like nothing more than looking at the inner configuration of your sound system. And that's really all it can do. PAVU control is like being at the head of an orchestra. What Mm -hmm. I mean by that is you can open up this sound configuration tool. And from in the sound configuration tool, if you start playing audio with rhythm box, for instance, you start to play audio with, with rhythm box. You can then open up PAVU control and say, show me what's being played back. Okay, now I want to repoint where that audio is going. So you don't have to even touch rhythm box and you don't have to touch any command line backend text files. You can use PAV control and say, okay, now I want to focus this audio to my headphones. Okay, now I want to focus this audio to my external speakers. Okay, now I want to focus this audio to another application to be recorded. And you can do the same thing with your mic input. This is the only way I know of in any operating system to manipulate audio without manipulating 
the end applications. And to me, this is the, the this is the best way to do it because I don't want to have to know how to configure um, Google Hangouts. I don't want to know how to how to configure Chrome. I don't want to know how to configure OBS. I don't want to know how to configure all um, all all Dasty. I don't want to know how to configure VLC. I don't. If I know PAVU control, I by default know all of them. And it's gold. That's all I'll say. Gold. Super easy interface. Uh, definitely gives you the power to look at you know incoming outgoing audio. And I, I love your example there when you were talking about you know piping certain audio to your headphones versus your speakers mainly because one of the additions I'm making to the office here is I'm installing a sound bar underneath my desk. And now I don't need to worry about getting some sort of like a, a physical switch box set up with cables, you know, going from, you know, here to there. I can just go into PAVU control because I'll have it set up uh, via optical right into the PC and uh, just be able to switch it that way when I want to, you know, watch some classic next generation or something in the office on one monitor or what whatever yeah yeah good stuff but yeah yeah could not agree more uh to, to have one to have one tool that you can walk into and have it be easy and to use it for all of your audio needs versus having to learn not only specific tools but but also the specific configuration types for different programs when you break it down like that it's like why wouldn't you use this instead right now the imperfection about the tool because nothing is perfect is depending on what distribution you install with what desktop you install with what audio stack you install it might be actual work to get pavu control configured to actually control all the inputs and outputs now i've been using uh gnome Ubuntu, and i can change my desktop to awesome or anything else and i still have complete pavu control working now sometimes even with regular u regular u um u uh u uh buntu when you load up pavu control it doesn't see all of the applications running or you cannot change the input output source so depending on what did distro you start with directly makes it um determines how difficult the task is to get pavu control working quote unquote perfectly Yep. Okay. <laughs> what we have next, Cody? Um, the, um, oh, this one I didn't even really get a chance to look at, but it sounded interesting. I would pronounce that binary. Yeah. Raspberry Pi watchdog timer. And I'm, and, th and literally th this was one of those week, uh, links from a couple weeks ago, weeks ago. So I got to look at this. I forgot what it was. Yeah, I haven't seen this either. Let me. Uh... So this is an easy way. You can A watchdog up... timer is an electronic timer used to detect and recover from computer malfunctions. During normal operation, the computer regularly restarts the watchdog timer to prevent it from elapsing or timing out. So then what this seems like to me is this is almost like a um heartbeat checking failover checking device so if you set it to check on another computer or itself and if it doesn't come back correctly it will basically force a, a reboot which i could see this being helpful and what they're showing it is on raspberry type raspberry pi type devices mm -hmm. which it's a headless device typically off in the corner doing stuff. So this is where you would want it to automatically reboot if something went wrong. Okay. So yeah. So I'm pretty sure now I ping, I uh, bookmark this for my own well being. And it makes sense why they would be speaking about it in, in that application, because specifically with raspberry Pi, you can th be thinking about a lot of uh, use cases for headless systems. Yeah. Where you you know you might you might not have an actual display hooked up to it if it's you know um, I mean running a multitude of things throughout your home or your business so to have something like this set up I mean sure you can you know review logs if you were having a constant fail and it really needed to kick into gear 
but having that as an extra step for for an application such as that would be definitely beneficial. Yes, have to agree absolutely wholeheartedly. Um, so I'm going to bookmark that. I'm going to keep that in my little list in the backside. Um, this next one comes with a public disclaimer because it, I guess it should. Okay. But come on. this is called torrent flicks okay? and it's linking to a YouTube video showing you how to use torrent flicks. I could not get this working on my current version of Linux. I'm using uh, Ubuntu based 1404 long-term support. I believe uh, in a couple months here, when 1604 comes out, I'll be able to load this. This to me is the ultimate in home entertainment processing, if you will. Okay. The video is just, it's a guy talking and it basically just shows you commands and stuff. What this is, is okay. It, it, it if you live in an extremely poor bandwidth zone, this will not work. If you live in a high bandwidth zone, this will work. Through this application, you basically, for instance, type die hard. And it will ask you which service do you want to use? Kick ass, seed peer, get strike, the pirate bay, blah, 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 blah. Then you hit enter. Okay. Then it gives you a list of search results back. Okay. Then you pick one, then you hit enter. Then it immediately starts streaming that video torrent to you. Now, sometimes it might take 20 seconds, 40 seconds, whatever, for it to start the buffering process and get enough in its queue. But with a good internet connection, I can't see this taking more than, you know, 40 seconds maybe to buffer and then to start playing. Um, the main reason I looked into this was because Star Wars. We had Star Wars, The Force Awakens, Force Awakes, whatever, I don't know, come out. And I really wanted to watch the first three movies that were released. Mm, episode four, five, and six. But I wanted to watch them in the most original native format as possible, which meant I had to find the de-specialized editions of the movie. Well, they're not official. If Disney had their way, whoever made them would be in jail. So I had to torrent them. And I really did not want to, part of me really didn't want to download them and keep them. I just wanted to stream them. So I well, tried but, to get this working. But to be fair, you, I believe under the Burn Act, you have the legal right to own a digital copy of them because you have them all on VHS, don't you? Yes, but these are slightly modified. Okay, all right. Because these are as close to those originals. And here's the thing. They're not like the original VHSs because even the original VHSs said in the very beginning of the crawl, episode four, A New Hope. The original, mm -hmm. original, original, original in 1977 did not say that. The crawl just started and it just told you about the um, rebels and everything going on. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And that's what this did. This is trying to be as close to that pure original, original, original as possible. So I couldn't get this working. So I had to torn them and now I got them on my Plex and they're glorious. Well. Yeah, my uh, my son Quentin he just turned four, and we I, we still have yet to go as a family and see *The Force Awakens* together. But he he had never seen any of the originals, so I broke down and just bought the Blu-ray set. But not knowing that they were going to be the you know the, the Lucas special editions, yeah. and once you start to see those you know little editions in, you, you know right away you're just like, oh, God, do we really need that creature walking in the background? Yeah. Do we really need the lightsaber effect to be that much better for those three seconds there? Come on, man. Well, I'll tell you, I, it's been in the theaters now for over a month, but I think you better hurry up because I don't think we're going to get a warning to go see it. And the only oh, thing yeah. I, the only thing I will say, and I don't want to spoil or anything, but the lightsaber effects are giddy, 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 giddy. 
They are unbelievably this. If there's anything that I can say, if they could have done this back in the day, they would have. It's the lightsaber effects, how the lightsabers look and just how they move. You know what I mean? It's just gold. Mm -hmm. But yes, torrent flicks, all one word. You have Netflix and then you have torrent flicks. So if you like your torrent content and you don't want to have to download everything, you just want to watch it. Torrent flicks is the way to go. And I wish I could have got it working myself. That's okay. Okay, now, this is another one I'm going to have to probably try if I look at this right, because I want to be legal. So what did I do? I just bought last week Idiocracy. Why? Because I like money. And I like Idiocracy. Yes. And I wanted to have it on my Plex server. But I didn't want to download it. I didn't want to pirate it. I found it online, eight bucks, ten bucks, whatever, DVD off of eBay. Bang, got it, shipped it in, put it in. I got a check. And it's like not reading. So you know, I don't it, it might be me, but well, you might I, like it idiocracy, but if you've actually seen it, you will know. So you'll know the answer to this. Tell me what plants like. Oh, uh, it's what plants crave, and that's electrolytes. There you go. All right. Cool. Um, okay. The uh, founder of Pirate Bay made a Raspberry Pi ultimate copying machine that I can't pronounce. I'm guessing it's just called Copy Machine because it's K O P I M A S H I N. Yeah. Right. Now, if you watch or listen to uh, Sunday morning Linux re <clears throat> review, uh, once again, I will say I'm thoroughly enjoying that show because of changes to it. Um, and, um, or you listen to, uh, pod nuts, the Sunday shows once in a while, there's this guy, Tom on same guy. He loves making appliances out of devices. Like he has an ultimate shredding device, which is raspberry Pi power. You stick, all you do is you stick the hard drive in and it automatically starts to do a shred of all the data. And then when it's done, you take the drive out, you put it, and then you put a brand new one in and it just starts doing it. So it's like hands-free. This is the same kind of thing, but for content. So the guy made an operating system that you just basically connect stuff to and it will automatically copy uh, the content from one device to uh, a um, to another device. So which I got to say, uh, that's kind of glorious, is what I'll say. Yeah, that does definitely sound cool. I love the little, uh, the little, um, what four by, or is it four? No, no, it, the little display on it. I think yeah. that's neat. The liquid crystal display, right? Yeah, the little it, LCD. Yes, and it harkens back to a day when times were simpler. And, to a simpler time. Yes. Yeah, to a simpler time. So if you want the ultimate copying machine then you need to download Copy Machine, K-O-P-I-M-A-S-H-I-N. I got to tell you, I'm, I'm, I mean, this is cool, but hearing you talk about that, that other thing about the, the, the data shredding Raspberry Pi, I thought mm -hmm. that was pretty neat too. We're going to have to cover that on a future show. Yeah, Tom definitely has a passion and he follows through with it. Because because anything short of throwing it into a microwave, mm -hmm. I guess would would be you know more cost effective, and and you don't have to deal with that messy cleanup. Well, yeah, I believe his logic is customers give him old machines, and he wants to refurbish them, or and donate them. So that's the safest way that he can do it because he he doesn't want to send them with a hard drive that's been nuked or smashed, but actually functioning. Right. Yeah. And. uh that's it's probably something along the lines of what they use at the next step like i was talking about that, that recycle center because yeah they have uh just bins and bins of drives anywhere from like you know uh i mean old you know uh pata drives ide anywhere from like you know 10 gigs up and it's just you know you, you buy them but yeah i uh, if i would ever buy one which i haven't yet or or more importantly donate a hard drive to them because i mean taking 
I, I've uh, I've taken a hammer to a hard drive a few times, and it's just kind of like uh, it, it's it's one of those like infomercial moments where you're like, there's got to be a better way, you right. know? And yeah, that definitely sounds like it. Right. But wait, there's more. Um, right. the, the only last thing I want to talk about re- re- really quick, I, I just stuck in the notes. Um, and I honestly I feel really dumb and I feel really bad and I feel really incompetent and I feel like I didn't do uh, you the right service, which is I should have told you about this before. It's called NetBoot, N-E-T-B-O-O-T. It's subtitled, Never Make Another USB Installer for Linux Again. You just need a fresh interesting about this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you don't know who Martin is, shame on you. Because you have to. He's the Rambo Obando. Um, he posted this, and this is almost what I was wishing for for years. You basically just install this to a flash drive, and then when you boot to it, you use the tool to point to other operating systems. And you can point to Arch Linux, CentOS, CoreOS, Debian, Fa, um, Fa, Dora, FreeBSD, Gentoo, Kali, OpenBSD, OpenSUSE, Rancher, Scientific, TinyCore, Ubuntu, blah, 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 blah. So you, from that one install media, quote unquote, you can install any of those distributions or bsds i thought that was awesome see i mean i i remember when i switched from optical media to usb for installs and it was just like a revolution to me i was like oh my god i don't, I don't like i can't think of a reason i need to buy another spindle of dvds ever or yeah. let alone cdrs you know and then i i read this and i i got to admit and some of you who are listening to this might might have had a little bit of a clinching, as it were, uh, much the same way I did. I'm I'm a little skeptical because it's it's such a big shift, especially with all the distros I install and all the machines I have all the time. I'm definitely going to give it a try because you know the the future is here, and you know why not? Um, but yeah, l- really looking forward to this. I remember Martin posted, and I was like, I I read it, and I was like, I, I got to read this again. Hold on, just just trying to wrap my brain around it all together. And yeah, it sounds like a great way to do it. And if if you're also thinking about the the, I mean, I, I mentioned this earlier in developing countries or in certain use cases like uh, uh, education, especially you know kids getting used to doing this stuff. Um, although USB drives are you know a dime a dozen now, pretty much literally. Um, why why take the time to you know make make that physical? A copy for installation when you when you can utilize a service like this as long as you know it's secure and it's faster and especially if you're talking about the um the, the more lightweight distros that could be uh installed and downloaded it quicker it's i think it's going to be a win-win overall right and the other little perk with this is not only can you install those different distributions but um stormwatch john just pinged me in the chat because i forgot to mention you also from this one usb key run avg rescue cd clonezilla dban g parted hdt i have no idea what hdt is but i'm sure it's like hard drive tune i'm gonna guess uh memtes part um par partition wizard which i'm sure is a g parted thing pogo stick which is an offline windows password and registry editor and then super grub disk too if you need to fix a misbooting computer. So not only do you get the OSs to install, but you get this suite of tools and Clonezilla alone makes it ridiculously powerful because, um, you know, it's Clonezilla. It's the one that really a lot of other ones uh, try to be. And then when they get corporate backing, they get better than, but it's still a great tool. Clonezilla is indispensable really. And I know well, Martin Rambo Bando loves it, and anything Martin loves has to be good because he's Martin. Yeah, although he's starting to like lighter beer more, and oh. although I don't, I don't respect him because of that. Well, I, I I lost a little bit of respect once I found out he's not drinking such such darker beer, but 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 he is taking up uh, better whiskey. So the the give oh. and take, you know, the give and take is good. Still, much love in my heart from Rambo. When I was at his house, he made me drink a little bit of scotch. And, oh, man. Yeah, it was like Glenn Limit 12 year. Not, not yeah. that I remember. Jeez. Not that you do. And that's when I realized. I thought before that that was confirmation. 
Martin's much more manlier than I. Because me, taller. I just couldn't handle it. I was like, wow. Yeah, and that was just a 12 year. I usually get the 18, or I've even had the, the, the 25 or 30. But yeah, it just it. I see, I like that stuff because it makes you slow down. It doesn't, I mean, it, it will slow you down, but it's not just like, well, go crazy. Like that is. I'm going to say at, at the conferences that I will be attending this year, I will have at mm. least one flask on me and I will mm. have some scotch in it. Oh, all righty. Well, good luck. Cause I'm going to have to deal with you the whole time I'm there. Yes. Yes, you will. And Northwest Linux Fest is coming up now from the time we record this show, almost four months away, maybe a day or two more. In four is it in late May or late April or early May this year? Late. April, like the last weekend in April, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so so it's only three months away then. 90 days. No, well, 97, le less than 100 days. You're right. You're right. You're right. Wow. Okay. So if you are in or going to be in the northwestern part of the United States at around that time, you have to let us know. Me, this is just me. I don't go to those events to sit in a room and listen to somebody I don't know go on about something that I have a mild interest in. I don't. I go to these events to meet people, to shake hands, to chat with other people, have a good time, go out, have a lunch, talk about experiences, talk about history, talk about past, talk about future things we can try, talk about things we can do kind of thing. Um, have fun. It just so happens at the same time, there are people in a room standing up in front of their people talking. And some people like that kind of thing. So if you like that kind of thing, you can go there. I'll be outside the room waving to you, waiting for you to get out of the room. There you go. Yeah, we'll definitely be at Northwest Linux Fest again this year. Had a blast last year. I finally got to meet Knucklehead Tech in person. Oh. His son, Jacob. Hey, Jacob. Uh, hang, you hang out with, uh, you know, uh, Martin, the boys, you know, Chuck. Uh, Aaron wasn't there Aaron wasn't uh, there. last year. Uh, we'll, we'll see if his wife lets him go this year. Steve was there. Steve was there. Yeah, Steve Sears. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And gosh, that guy and his gadgets. Mm -hmm. Can't wait to see he brings this year. That'll be fun. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, over, overall, good time. Yeah. So if you're anywhere, you know, uh, Oregon, Idaho, Washington, Montana, even the northern tip of California, um, even though you've just got a little scale, potentially. Yeah. This, see, this and comp. again. This is proof why I can't go to scale, Cody. Scale just ended, right? Yes. If I would have went to scale, I would have went to scale the very next day or so, 31 plus inches of snow drop on my wife and my children. And I'm in Southern California. So, that's, that's not cool. I can't do that to them. I can't. No, it's very cold. It's no. so, it's so cold. It actually caused it to snow. I cannot do that to them. So the likelihood I ever go to scale is two choices, two chances. That's slim and none. Unless I bring everybody. And what's the likelihood of that happening? Uh, I'll make it happen. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to her. We'll figure it out. Uh-huh. Sure. You know, you know how persuasive I am. Yeah. I'm uh -huh, sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, like I always say, I always offer that. But worst case scenario, she'll just never talk to me again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and for those of you who are craving some linux gaming news i know there's millions of you out there i'm just going to mention this one thing good good uh the the one thing i missed talking about in 2015 as far as linux gaming news and i i tell you if if you'd had asked me the probability of this happening what i'm about to say in in a million years i'd probably say that there's no way it's ever going to happen but Street Fighter Five. Oh, you're going to be able to play Street Fighter Five on Linux. Oh, it has when official this... SteamOS support. When is this happening? It actually releases on February 16th. So we might have another small <laughs> no, absence no, no, no. <laughs> of shows. Is your that's what you're telling me? <laughs> no, no, I, I could play any other day, but Tuesday. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, and for those of you who don't know, I'm a huge Street Fighter nut. Have been since the very first game. I mean, I was a big arcade rat, you know, mall rat when I was a kid, and I've played every iteration of it throughout the years. Um, but yeah, the hype for this version is huge already. 
uh, it being exclusive to PC and PS4 was big news. But mm-hmm. just within the last 30 or 45 days, they announced it's also going to have full SteamOS support. Now, this is coming directly from Capcom, the developer okay. of the game. Okay. This is not them taking it to a third party and porting it. It's going to... I, I, I can't wait to see it. Because, I mean, if I can play... Because, honestly... If I if it was if I if I had to play it on PC, that would be the only thing that I honestly think I would ever install Windows for again. <laughs> and I haven't installed Windows on any of my boxes in at least four or five years. Actually, no, it's been it's been really really long. I, well, I ran the Nexus Toolkit on an old laptop. My sister is on a horrible Vista installation, but I haven't used Windows for anything since about oh oh well, actually probably oh three. Is there been, anything been, else? Than a horrible Vista installation, isn't that like de facto? Oh my god! But I, I, th- that doesn't even matter. I I just needed it for you know to to root and unlock my bootloader on my phone. That's it. But know, but, but but I know. But here's the question I have for you. Okay. I know you. Mm-hmm, you did. And I know a Steam controller might be cool, but when it comes to Street Fighter, it's not. I know yeah. you have a. Big enough thing that I could probably kill a couple people with before it takes any real damage. Game pad, sit on a coffee table, multiple feet by multiple feet, buttons and sticks. Yeah, I have, I'm looking over here to my right. I, I have nine arcade sticks on this rack here. And I think I have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have eight different game controllers on my but, desk alone right now. But, but I, yeah, I, but only will they play... work? Oh yeah, no, they they they'll be plug and play. What what's what's nice about it too? Um, well, I will personally be playing arcade stick. I grew up in the arcade. I like the arcade stick. I never played it on pad, right. except for if you know anything about Street Fighter. There's two different kinds of kinds of two main kinds of characters in the way they play. There's charge characters and yeah, there's, Blanca, there's the, Honda, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then they call them either the motion characters or Shotos, Game which is you know, or, okay. yeah, the, the the quarter circle, half circle guys, yeah. So when I used to play a charge character, I would play with a gamepad because it's just easier for me. But I mainly don't play charge characters. So yeah, I have an arcade stick and I'm, I'm an arcade stick nut. I have a bunch of them. Yeah. But yeah, um, what's nice is with all the arcade, actually most of them I have are for Xbox 360 anyway, which means that if I were to plug it into a PC traditionally under Windows, it would detect it as a Microsoft controller, Microsoft operating system, boom, plug, you know, plug and play, Bob's your uncle, you're fine. But when I played Street Fighter 4 on uh, Steam, a version of uh, uh, Ultra, uh, was it about a year ago at my buddy's house? Not only were the three sticks I brought over to test detected automatically by Steam, but it wasn't just wired USB controller. It told me the actual manufacturer and oh, wow. model of so every single one I put in. It read the chipset. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and, and it, it, was, it was not just the chipset, too. Like, it could tell me the the manufacturer and the model of the actual stick and everything right. is crazy so to have that kind of uh support you know uh 12 18 months ago just through steam alone i, I was kind of blown away by that but yeah i just can't ima- i mean it's very exciting for me to have two of my favorite things come together and for me to because everybody has that one thing that they still run windows for i haven't run windows since like 03 i was a mac guy for a while and i transitioned from mac to linux back in 08 09 but if i i i have a ps4 so i would play it on that but if i had to play it on pc for whatever reason like i didn't have a ps4 then yeah i would probably go get some windows 8.1 license and just you know have no browser on it and just use it specifically for that but now i don't need to and i and i trust me when that comes out i will have a copy of it i'll uh I'll uh, give you a full review. I also have a new, a couple new pieces of hardware, gaming hardware. I'm going to plug in and try on Linux and let you guys know about that in the near future as well. Very cool. Yeah. I never realized the difference between charge and motion characters. The only charge character I ever played was Vega. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I played him was, man, did I make people mad when I played him? Yeah. You can, uh, especially with uh, a buddy of mine at our, uh, in our gaming group, he had this troll Vega. You know, he just did those same three moves over and over again, but yeah. he would randomize them just to see how good of a player you were. If you could actually get get out of it or not, and we tried. And we just had this is my buddy Dan. We just had him play all the new people mm-hmm. that would come in, 
just to test their level of skill and then we could potentially place them at different tables you know right instead of just throwing anybody in that was you know either way too inexperienced yeah. with more experienced guys and vice versa yeah from vega all i did wall jump slam roll punch and the slide sweep that's all i did yeah. that's yep. all i had to do and he's in the new game by the way I know, but uh, it's a question of time for me. I have to figure out how I can get my um, son. Because mm -hmm. uh, that's my excuse going to be, well, he needs it. So I'm going to try to get him a steam box. But um, I'm thinking I'm going to probably build it myself, quote unquote. Oh, yeah. Um, and hearing that kind of news makes me much more confident in saying I can make it a Linux rig and I don't have to worry about a Windows rig. Yes. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, yeah, looking forward to reporting on that and a couple other things, but we'll, we'll keep that for another time. I believe that was the last item that we really wanted to speak about today. Is that correct? Yes. And I will say for some reason, everything I reply to now, I can't stop for the last couple of days. Whenever I can, I've been just saying not sure. Which <laughs> You're is not sure about saying not sure which is another idiocracy thing that I just find myself, cannot, I can't stop saying. I've even, in meetings and stuff, when someone says something, they look at me and say, not sure. So much of that has, uh, everything from that film has bled into my psyche, but I literally probably haven't seen it in hmm. uh, at least 10 years. It's like the Princess Bride yes. in how it just, it is what it is. There's nothing else like it. And parts of it will just stick in your psyche, whether it's rodents of unusual size mm -hmm. or whether it's President Camacho. <laughs> which, oh, I, man. which I which I will say, you know, my only comment about politics is this. 99.9999999999% of what all politicians talk about, I really don't care about. And what I mean by that is, they're again talking about something typically too big, too vast, too hard to actually change. If they would just run on platforms like I'm going to get rid of daylight savings time, I'd be much more interested because it's much more doable and they would win my vote. It, it's not that, well, with, with, with the, I don't want to say limited scope, but limited time they have, they need to talk about important topics. But if one of them talked about a bunch of interesting ones, mm -hmm. Much of like you know, we get rid of daylight savings time. Why? Because I don't like it. Mm -hmm. I, whatever. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Well, hey, man. Once again, it's great to be back. So it's always good to uh, chat with you, man. And I look forward to hanging out with you here in three months. I almost said four months again. Three months. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, you're actually talking about Northwest Lake Fest. You're talking yeah. about me returning to the show after Street Fighter Five. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually yeah. going to a conference. Yeah, I know it's going to be good. It's going to be good, and I don't want to make any promises, but I'm trying to make it to another one toward the end of the year. Uh, the the return. And let me tell you something: that ice machine better be ready. I hear you. All right, cool. Well, hey everybody, um, please, if if you if you like what you heard, if you missed this, just go ahead and send send a little email into uh, mail at podcast .com. Or you can send it to me at Cody at uh, podnest.com as well. But you want to send it a show. Actually, you want to send it a show directly to the show. Uh, send it to podcast and Linux for the rest of us. Uh, dot com. That would be great. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I, I can't not mention the ACF.tk. Our good friend, you know, Jonathan Nader, who we spoke about earlier in the show, he is still very, very much uh, involved with the Accessible Computing Foundation. In fact, uh, I, I'm still a contributor, have been for, I think, maybe four years now, doing wonderful, wonderful things to bring technology to those who would desperately need it, those with disabilities, instead of leaving them in the dark, making uh, technology accessible for them and for, for people across a huge swath of people that would otherwise be left behind is very important. So please head over to the ACF.TK, see if you can contribute as little as $2 a month, because that money goes a long way to helping a, a large, a, sign, a more significant uh, amount of people than you would realize. And it's definitely great to do. If you want to send us in a voicemail as well, please send it into 7076 Podnut. That is 
676-3688. Please try to keep it under a minute. If it's, you need to go a little longer, that's fine. If it's going to be two, three, four minutes, maybe break it up into a couple of them. We'll totally play them back to back real quick. As I stated before, fantastic to be back. I can't wait to get back in this saddle next week. And please don't forget that Linux is not just for the rest of us. It is for all of us. Good night.